Hello, astronomy. Welcome to our first video lecture for unit four, the solar system. So we're going to have three videos for this unit. Uh, the first video is going to be on the inner planets, the second video on the outer planets, and the third video on other objects in the solar system. So let's begin with this image. So this, is, this image is a, um, a scale diagram of the solar system in terms of the size. Obviously, the distances are not even attempting to be accurate here, but you can see that the sun is over 99% of the mass of the solar system is contained in the sun, I should say. You can see the next largest object is Jupiter, but Jupiter doesn't even come close to the, the mass of the sun. And keep in mind that you know, these objects are, are, are three-dimensional. Um, so you know, if you look at Jupiter, hundreds of Jupiters could fit inside the sun um, at, at the same time. So this image, if you want to look at the scale of the solar system by distances, um, in this image, you, you can see the inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Jupiter and Saturn obviously are much further away than the inner planets. And you'd have to zoom out even further, an image like this. And even this image is not really completely the scale. Um, but to get the outer planets in the image, and you can see one thing I like about this diagram is you can see Pluto's orbit. A couple of things about it that are, that are unusual. So first off, Pluto has a, an orbit that comes out or it kind of bends in the plane of the solar system. It tends to go above or below the plane. And you can see that Pluto's orbit crosses Neptune in a couple of different places, it crosses it there and there, and here and here. So there are periods of time, like in this period right here, when Pluto is actually closer to the sun than Neptune. We're gonna discuss in the third video you know, when I was in school, we, we learned that Pluto was a planet. It was in the early 2000s that Pluto got demoted to a dwarf planet. But we're going to see why that, why that was in the third video. But I remember when I was in third grade and I learned the order of the planets and Pluto was at the end, during that time, um, actually Pluto was the, the eighth planet from the sun. Neptune was further out than Pluto was. Again, this diagram isn't completely accurate either, but it gives you a nice sense of why Pluto's orbit is so irregular. Um, this diagram looks at the, at the plane from above, and you can see, I mean, again, this one just only goes out to Jupiter, um, the relative distances from the sun to, in this case, Earth, Mars, and then um, Jupiter. So this is kind of a cool diagram. This is how big the sun would look on other planets. So if you look at Earth, here's Earth, here's the size of the sun in the sky. Just take a minute to appreciate, there's the sun size for Mercury, Venus, Mars. It's not much smaller, but it's smaller. And then Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. By the time you get to Neptune, the sun's not that much bigger than just, just a star in the sky. This is a cool little um, like interactive. If the moon were only one pixel, um, a tediously accurate scale model of the solar system. So in this scale, the moon is one pixel. And just to give you an idea, I'm just gonna scroll uh, quickly. One pixel is about 3,500 kilometers, which is the diameter of the moon, roughly the distance from New York to Las Vegas. And what you can do, let me get this started. So you can see there's a running scale here. Here we're almost to a million kilometers. Um, you, you can scroll by hand, which gets kind of tedious, or you can just click. So there's the sun. If I click on, if I click on Mercury here, it will take you to it. Okay, there's Mercury. The, the words that just zoom by, there's some like little clever insets, little clever inserts, I guess, as you go throughout. If you want to read the little clever lines, you're going to have to um, do this yourself. Just Google um, if the moon were a pixel or just go to joshworth.com. So anyway, so here we're about 60 million kilometers or so um, to get to Venus. We have to go even further, about 110 or so million kilometers. Obviously next we're gonna get to Earth, Earth and the moon, I should say. About 151 million, of course it depends where you are in the orbit in this, in this precise distance but about, about 151 million um, kilometers. Now we need to get to Mars, pretty far out, about 230 million kilometers. All right, and now we're gonna get to Jupiter, which is way further out, 
Jupiter and the four Galilean moons, um, 780 million kilometers, give or take. Saturn, oh boy, Saturn's about 1.4 billion kilometers. Saturn, its biggest moon, Titan. And we're gonna get to Uranus. All right, close to 3 billion kilometers. And then Neptune, oh gosh. About four and a half billion kilometers. And then lastly, this one does include Pluto. Upwards of six um, billion. Pluto, we still love you because you might not be a planet, but Pluto hasn't changed. Uh, we just changed how we classify it. Might as well stop now. We will need to scroll through 6,771 more maps like this before we see anything else. Um, yeah, that's just kind of a, a cool little and interactive. Okay, so at this point, we're going to go through the, um, the, you know, there are four inner planets. We're not really going to go through Earth because everything else you've ever learned in any other class in school was technically about the Earth in some way, at least it occurred on Earth. So let me just preface this by saying, you know, in the video, we're not doing an exhaustive deep dive at each planet. The readings that I assign um, through Unit 4 are, are, are more designed to get into all the nitty gritty details. We're just going to hit the highlights of the planets, talk about some key facts and, and show some, some pretty pictures. So Mercury is the first planet. It is named after the, um, the messenger god, right? The god with the like, winged shoes. Mercury um, is the fastest planet because it orbits, um, it does orbit the sun because it's the first planet quicker than any, any other planet. Um, it's only only a couple months to do one orbit and when you can see mercury in the sky it's always near the sun which makes sense because it's an inner planet just like, like venus you can see mercury is heavily cratered so the fact that a planet's heavily cratered tells me two things first it tells me that it, the planet doesn't have much of an atmosphere to burn up objects that might impact it like the earth does mercury has a very 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 thin atmosphere not much to it at all um, largely because, well, really two reasons. Mercury is so small, um, it's not much bigger than our moon, but it, Mercury's gravity doesn't have much of a pull on an atmosphere. The atmosphere would just escape into space. And Mercury being so close to the sun, the sun's solar winds, which we'll talk about in unit, unit five, tend to sort of blow off in the atmosphere that Mercury ever could possibly hang on to. So, um, Okay, so quick aside, so the Mariner probes, um, the Mariner probes were a series of probes in the 60s and 70s um, launched by NASA. Um, there were 10 of them, I believe. The Mariner probes, you know, NASA's doing this at the same time they're doing the, um, the space race, are, were a series of probes designed to go to either um, Venus, some went to Mars, Mariner 10 actually went to Venus and Mercury. It was the first probe to visit more than one planet. And it did the whole like slingshot thing, went to slingshot thing, went to Venus, then built up speed and did this little tra tra trajectory change to go to Mercury. Some of the Mariner probes failed. Mariner 1, for instance, there was a, um, an error in the liftoff of the rocket and the um, the probe had to be remotely destroyed or the rocket was re was remotely destroyed. A few of them failed, but um, some went to Venus, some went to Venus and then Mercury. I think one of them did that. And then some went to, to Mars. So this is a picture of Mercury from, I think it's Mariner 10. You can see heavily cratered, not much different looking than our moon. And actually, like in this picture, this is a size comparison of Mercury and the Earth. And Mercury is not much bigger than our moon. There are moons of Jupiter, um, at, least, at least Ganymede, is actually bigger than Mercury. Um, so, you know, Mercury could easily be a moon of another planet, but because it orbits the sun by itself, it is a planet. Um, I should also note that Mercury doesn't have any moons of its own. Um, the first planet to have a moon of its own would be Earth. So the messenger probe was sent, um, more recently, it was sent in the 2000s. The messenger probe did a much, you know, the, the, the Mariner probes were like flyby missions. Messenger probes spent more time at Mercury, gave us very good maps. 
and it gave us some cool, of course, the, this is a like a color enhanced image, cool images of mercury. Here's some look, looks like radar telemetry. Of course, the, the colors are, are enhanced in this case, I guess, to show altitude. Um, here you can see what they've done here is enhance some of the colors to show the different types of rocks that are on Mercury. And you can see the probe eventually crashed into Mercury's surface. Okay, so that's all we're going to say about Mercury. So Venus. Venus is, of course, the second planet from the Sun. Um, this is a real color image taken by Mariner 10. So Venus um, is the only planet named for a goddess. Um, the goddess of beauty. So obviously, you know, the, the ancient Greeks, you know, knew Mercury, they knew through, through Saturn. And Venus was named Venus because if you see the planet in the sky, it's very, very bright. It shines like a diamond in the sky. And they named it after the goddess of, of beauty, which was Aphrodite. Of course, the Roman name was Venus because it was a, a beautiful shining orb in the sky. Now, in reality, the closer you get to Venus, you realize it's actually kind of a hellhole. Um, Venus has a very, very intense greenhouse effect. The atmosphere of Venus is very thick. What you're seeing in this picture are, are clouds. You're not seeing the surface, you're seeing atmosphere. Um, due to the greenhouse effect, which again is caused by carbon dioxide, the planet's surface is very, very hot. Venus is actually hotter on its surface than Mercury is, even though Venus is um, further away. It has um, thick clouds of sulfuric acid. Um, so between the intense greenhouse gases or effect, the hot temperatures, the pressure due to all the, you know, the atmosphere bearing down on you, and the acidic nature of the atmosphere, Venus is not anywhere that you would want to spend much time. You know, we talk a lot about mankind once or eventually maybe going to Mars. No one talks about going to Venus because it is hell. Um, sometimes Venus is called Earth's sister planet just because it's not that much smaller than Earth. In terms of size, Venus and Earth are much closer. Earth is a little bit bigger um, than, say, Earth and Mars. Um, so this is a picture showing showing the size comparison. This this is showing um, the surface of Venus using um, different radar techniques. So the the Soviet Union um, in the era of the space race did a series of probes called the Venera probes to try and land on Venus. We have never, to my knowledge, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. We've never even tried to land a probe on Venus's surface. Um, the Venera probes, you know, if you have time, Google them, um, V-E-N-E-R-A, where many of them failed um, because, again, landing on Venus due to the thick clouds, the temperatures, the pressure, the sulfuric acid, this is a picture from the actual surface of Venus. This is a Venera probe that successfully landed. Any kind of electronics is not going to last very long on Venus due to, again, the, the, the conditions. Um, but this uh, Venera probe was able to send back um, pictures from the surface of Venus. Again, this is, this is a, a Soviet probe. It's also worth just knowing, it just popped in my head, that you know, these probes were called the Venera. It was called the, the, the Venera series of probes. There were several of them. It's the same root as the word venereal disease, um, which is an STD, which you know, I guess to, to the ancients, Venus, venereal, um, Aphrodite, goddess of love, beauty, somehow they related all those things together. Um, you can probably connect those dots together yourself. Another image of Venus. So if you look at Venus through a, through a telescope, um, it might not look quite quite this good, but you can, you can see Venus um, very clearly through, of course, with the naked eye, you can see it too. But you can also see that Venus goes through, goes through phases with a, just a simple backyard telescope. This is a cool picture. This is a transit of the sun by Venus. Obviously, this is multiple exposures put together, but you can see sort of like a Venetian eclipse in a way, or actually, actually it's more like a, a solar eclipse due to Venus. Um, but you can get very, very accurate measurements on how quickly Venus is orbiting and its size by looking at um, 
Venus when it transits the surface of the sun. All right, so again, we're skipping Earth because we've discussed you know, everything I've ever learned in school had to do with the Earth. Um, so Mars, Mars gets a lot of attention, obviously, um, in, in the rovers we send and in pop culture. You can see in this picture, Mars has ice caps on its poles. The, the iron oxide on the surface gives it this sort of reddish tinge. If you see Mars in the sky, if you're looking straight at Mars and you know which one is Mars, you can totally tell that it's red. So Mars has been the recipient of the most probes of any of any planet, um, not just NASA, other China, the European Space Agency, lots of Russia, lots of people send robotics to, to Mars, either probes or rovers or landers that have landed on Mars. Um, in terms of a size comparison, again, Mars isn't I mean, it's bigger than the moon, but it's not that much bigger than the moon. The reason we care about Mars so much or have so much interest is it's obviously close. Um, you can get there in just a handful of months. And its atmosphere is, is very, very thin. It has a very thin atmosphere of carbon dioxide, like Venus, but Venus has a thick atmosphere of CO2. Mars is very, very thin. But the gravity is, is not that much less than Earth. Um, and in terms of the temperatures, it, it gets very, very cold, but it can be in, in the warmest, it can be like 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So in terms of the temperatures, it's way more doable to send robotics or potentially people, as long as you're in an isolated settlement or a spacesuit, um, than it would be for, for Mars or for Venus, I should say. So we've probably discussed this a little bit before. So in the 90s, 96 or 97, I think it was 96. Um, this was a rover that we sent to Mars in the movie, The Martian, um, well, the, the book first, the book is better, which became a movie later with Matt Damon. Um, he finds the Pathfinder rover um, in the book or the movie. And this was a rover, again, that landed, I think 96, it might be 97. I was a junior in high school, I believe. And it landed with these airbags where the airbags inflated and you know bounced around and finally it stopped and the rover drove out. But what's cool about Pathfinder was Pathfinder would send back these panoramic images. This is showing kind of like one of them. And I gotta be honest, like they were just mesmerizing. Like you'd have magazines where you would have the whole, like the, the pull out spread like in, in time or National Geographic and the, in the atmosphere of Mars or the surface of Mars looks like you could just be in the desert. Um, you can see clouds, you can see like little tornadoes, you can see wind shaped dunes. Um, it looks like you could be on Earth. You could download these images and like click and scroll like you were there, which is just the coolest thing ever. Um, that was the Pathfinder mission. So since then, we have sent many rovers to Mars. Um, this is the Curiosity rover, which landed, I believe, in 2012. The Curiosity rover, so the you know, the previous rovers were interesting. They, they had instruments, but, you know, it was the, the images that were, got the most attention. The Curiosity rover, and more recently, the Perseverance rover, which this is the Perseverance rover launched in 2020, and landed in, I believe, February of 2021, is these rovers um, are like little laboratories. They can drill. This is, this is Curiosity taking a selfie. Um, they can drill, they have a, a little laser thing to sample um, the soil or, or the rocks. What's cool about this picture um, is, you know, like here you see like a, a windswept dune, but these rocks here look like they could be the bottom of a, like a riverbed. Um, all of our Martian studies have shown us that Mars used to have liquid water, like, like shallow lakes. The parts of Mars were actually um, uh, underwater. So I'm sure in class we've discussed um, my friend Mohawk guy, um, Bobek Ferdowski, um, or Ferdowski, I should say. Um, we've discussed this when the Curiosity rover landed. He was the guy with the colored Mohawk and the star shaved into his head. I want to briefly show um, a TED talk. So if, we've, if I've shown you this before, just skip the next six minutes of this video. This is the TED talk he gave about how, how the Curiosity rover landed, because it did land with the airbags, it used a different system. And the more recent Perseverance rover landed with the same system. 
but let's watch this again. If you've seen this already, just skip skip ahead the next thing. About 100 days ago, we landed a two-ton SUV on the surface of another planet, on the surface of Mars. This is one of the first pictures we took there with our rover, looking out at Mount Sharp. Uh, to me, it's, I kind of cry a little bit, choke up when I see this picture. Why Mars, and why do we look at these other planets? And part of it's to understand our own planet. What's the context for us? Uh, we live on this amazing planet, but Mars is a lot like Earth. It's, it's similar in size. During the daytime, it can get up to about 70 degrees in the uh, Fahrenheit. So it's so like Earth, but at the same time, you know, this is a barren landscape. You don't see any trees, you don't see any cactuses growing, anything like that. So today I want to tell you about the story of how we got from Earth to Mars and why it's so cool. So one of the things we start with is a blank sheet of paper. We, we knew from the previous missions in 2004, Spirit and Opportunity, there was water on Mars in the past. But, you know, what's the next step? We're looking for even more fundamental level of what does it take to have life survive? And so to have that kind of you know, knowledge and understanding, we have to carry a, a massive amount of instruments. Uh, we have to carry the kind of labs that people actually have whole rooms devoted to on Earth inside of essentially a small car. And what we did was we shrunk it all down to something that weighs about as much as I do, uh, and then put it inside of this rover that weighs you know, as much as your car does. And that rover uh, is now on the surface of Mars, but it's so heavy. And so it kind of takes a special challenge for us to, to make it all work and come together. So we look at our tool of like, what do we have to land stuff on Mars? And one of the options is airbags. We've done it before. Airbags are pretty cool. They bounce around a lot. Uh, you could never put a human inside of an airbag because they would get squashed. Uh, but the problem with airbags is the airbags that you see here, which landed the smaller rover, it's like 400 pounds, the entire rover, uh, was, were about the size of this room. So you can imagine the size of airbags we would take to land a two-ton rover on Mars. And then they have to be actually made out of materials that don't even exist today. So it would be some kind of exotic material that we'd have to develop and may or may not work. So what about rockets? And this is the way we've like, you know, you see all the rocket ships landing in the old movies and everything else, all rockets on the bottom. It's a, it's a cool idea. It works when they're pretty light still. But the problem is these rockets have to be pretty strong to actually softly land you on Mars. And so they would be so powerful that they could actually dig holes into the ground and then you would just end up inside of a hole and not be able to drive out of it. So not the best design. But what if I could take the rockets and move them up? And that's kind of what we came up with. It's actually a rocket-powered jetpack. We call it the Sky Crane. And basically what it does is this big rocket sits on top of our rover. And when we're ready to land, the rockets kind of hover in place. And we slowly lower the rover to the ground. And then we touch down. We're actually on the wheels. We're ready to drive day one. But in addition to that, you know, the scientists were like, well, we actually want to go somewhere interesting. The last two missions, they're really cool, but they basically landed in what was like landing in the plains or the desert. Not very exciting. We all know like from the exciting places on Earth are like the places like the Grand Canyon and things like that. And those are the, for the scientists, the most interesting because you see that whole layer. You see years and years of history all in one place. And the same thing is true for where we landed. Uh, we wanted to land somewhere that was unique, that had this crater walls where things had been dug up for us, where mountains were pushing things up. But the problem is, if you landed with the older systems, you could have landed on the side of that mountain and just tumbled off. Could have been the side of a cliff. Could have been the crater wall or a large boulder. So we needed a kind of technology uh, to help us land in a very small area. And that was this little guided entry from Apollo. We took it from the 1960s. We flew over, just like the man people, because they have to actually pick up men. They can't just land all over the place. Uh, and then we landed like, like spot on in the middle. And in fact, it's so spot on that uh, when we did it, we were able to basically like a quarterback, you know, launching towards Mars. It was like a quarterback, though. The quarterback was in Seattle and throwing at a receiver that was moving here in Giant Stadium. That's how accurate we were. It's kind of awesome. But you only get one shot. And so we actually have to design a system that we can build and test and operate. And so it's not just about, you know, can we get it to Mars? But then if it's only one chance, how do you make sure that one chance goes so well? And so there's all these processes we have to make sure that things are built properly. And then we go out to the desert, and we drive it around, and we test it. We fly things in F-18s to make sure the radar systems work at high speeds. And then, most importantly, we actually test the team to make sure they know how to operate it. We don't want to accidentally miss it because we go, oh, sent the wrong command, and now it's just going to be rebooting forever. So that guy, Fred, there, he, he did a lot of that. 
And then we launched it on this rocket to Mars. And, the, you know, the entire thing, we landed 2,000 pounds on Mars, but the entire thing actually was about 10,000 pounds when we lifted it off from Earth, all the fuel and the solar arrays and everything else that we needed. And again, we're so accurate that we landed in this, like, little pinpoint on Mars. And we, in the meantime, though, we had to design a landing system that worked. And I told you about the actual physics of it, but here's the catch. Mars is about 14 minutes away from Earth from light speed, which means that if I tried to control it with a joystick, I would be always controlling to 14 minutes in advance, so it wouldn't work. So we had to give it all the smarts and all the knowledge that it needed in order to make it happen. And so what we did was we built in all these smarts and algorithms and everything, and we told it, here's what you're going to have to do. And it goes from basically the speed, uh, five times the speed of a speeding bullet to about a baby's crawl, all within about seven minutes, which is called the seven minutes of terror, because I was about to throw up. <laughs> but today we're on the surface of Mars, and this was one of the panoramas that we took a couple of days after we landed. And I, I think it's amazing to me because you look at this and you can see the Grand Canyon. You can see your own planet. You can imagine walking on the surface. And so what we're going to do and what we're going to continue to do is to understand why, what makes Mars so special and what makes Earth even more special that we're all here together today. And so we'll see where curiosity takes us, not just our rover, but our sense of exploration. Thank you. All right, cool. So... This is a picture that shows a spot where Curiosity drilled a hole into the soil. You can see the dust. And the rover has instrumentation on it where it can analyze what's in the, the sample. And Curiosity has shown that there are minerals on the surface of Mars that, that are formed when they're underwater. And here you can see in this picture, like these look like sort of rocks that would be at the bottom of like a riverbed. You see little pebbles that have been rounded by flowing water. Here you can see the rocks been eroded to a nice flat thin sheet. You can almost picture water going on that little seam right there. But Curiosity has shown us that at some point in history, Mars was covered um, at least partially by water, sort of like a, like a, a flat lake, or flat lakes that cover the surface of Mars. Okay, so I wanna end with this one very brief video. Um, from the Curiosity rover. So we're gonna show this and then we'll call it a video. This is the largest and highest resolution panorama the Curiosity rover has ever taken. It's made up of almost 1,200 individual images taken over four days. The rover's body is too close for the mass cam's telephoto lens, but we were able to capture the rover using the other mass cam lens. The higher resolution version is nearly 1.8 billion pixels. What I love about this panorama is that we can zoom way in and see details far in the distance. When you start to do that, you can see the rim of the crater we're inside of all the way to the north. Here's an impressive sight. 20 miles away is Slang Post Crater, just inside Gale Crater's rim. End-to-end, -end, Slang Post is three miles wide. Something huge must have struck here. Whenever I start to think that Mars looks familiar, sites like this dramatic impact crater remind me that we're looking at a different planet. Curiosity is exploring a clay-bearing region on the side of a mountain. This ancient landscape was the site of lakes and streams billions of years ago. They left their clues in the finely layered, clay-rich rock. This crumbling cliff is the edge of the green hue pediment. It's a vast sheet of rock draped over the side of a mountain. It must have formed after the lakes disappeared and the mountain took its present shape. Did it once extend even farther out? Curiosity looks a bit like an abstract painting here. That's because this is a 360 degree perspective. The image is warped, like looking through a fisheye lens. You can make out some amazing details on the rover itself. This is the shadow of Curiosity's mast. Here's RAD, an instrument that detects radiation from the sun and space. Thanks to RAD, we have a better idea of how to protect future astronauts on Mars. Why are there severed tubes and wires on the rover? These tubes were part of the fluid cooling system that circulated throughout the spacecraft that flew the rover to Mars. These wires were like an umbilical cord for data. They were cut during landing. In spite of all the dust, 
our sundial still tells us to explore. Trailing behind the rover, you can see our tracks, including where we climbed up a hill. Even after seven years on Mars, Curiosity is not done making tracks yet. Panoramas like this are like a window to another world. Explore it yourself in a 360 video. Look for the link in the description.